Behold the pillars of the waking world, the eight towers of Tamriel, akin to the eight spokes of the orbic wheel, solidified by the laws of time and nature. The mortal realm of Mundus lives by virtue of the Aedra's lent bones, the gift limbs bestowed upon the creator Trickster Tester Lorcan. Just as their sacrifice gives structural integrity to the wheel, so too do the pillars of Kimel Garjig provide the scaffolding for the flawed and frail planet of Nern. They are the fingers of the royal hands of order, jutting to the heavens, the greatest wonders of the natural world, and the Falmor wish to tear them down. The Red Tower trembled, spewing great plumes of smoke and sulfur from its gaping fumarole, its stones set free by the Nerevarine. The Tower of Walking Brass, willed into divinity by its mortal makers, was destroyed following the miracle of peace. The distant Tower of Orakalk sank along with Yakuda, a victim of the apocalyptic strike of the Pancrato Sword. The pristine crystalline Tower of Transparent Law was sullied and shattered by Daedra Hordes. From the perchance acorn germinated the unlikeliest of towers, sprouting skyward as a mighty green pillar. On reefing roots impossibly strong, the green sap tower wanders the wilds of Valenwood, its bowl, bough and branches held hostage by those who seek to fell it. The Tower of White Gold, a reflection of the Ur Tower, unguarded by the dragon and ripe for the taking. And Lorcan's larynx, the Snow Tower, protected by the elements, but not safe from the civil unrest within its homeland. Half of these towers have been destroyed or deactivated. Of those that remain active, one lies within the territory of the Old Merry Dominion, while two dwell within lands the Dominion are actively seeking to control. The Falmor watch while the Imperials and Nords weaken one another. There is only one tower that remains beyond the ever-expanding grasp of the Old Merry Dominion. And that is the greatest tower of all, Tower Zero, Adamantia. Is it mere coincidence that the High Elves have been waging a brutal war across Tamriel's west? What will happen if they reach the shores of the Iliac Bay and gaze upon the oldest structure on Nern? Will they see a stronghold from which to launch new campaigns for continental domination? Or will they see the final key to unmaking this mortal trap, the preeminent pillar of creation? The last bar of their cell, ready to break under the weight of Numantia, which is liberty. Just as Magnus the Architect devised the schematics and diagrams that would be used in the formation of the Mundus, the Falmor have conceived their own blueprint for Armageddon. This plot will be the focal point for the main quest of the Elder Scrolls VI, and I'm going to cover it all in great detail, as I fear for the future of Tamriel. Let's get started. The Second Era came to an end when Tiber Septim acquired the Nemidium and completed his conquest of Tamriel. The Ultima had no intention of cooperating with the Monarch of Men, but the Brass Tower was not to be denied. The Pocket Guide says that the conquest and assimilation of Somerset into the Empire is remembered by many a living Ultima with horror only partially diminished by time. Certainly, the pride of the people has never recovered. The Empire of Cyrodiil used the power of the most profane anti-creation to bring the High Elves to their knees. And for the bulk of the Third Era, the proud province of Somerset was crippled. Throughout history, the Ultima had successfully fought off the zealous, jealous Malmer of Pyandania. And it is a testament to Somerset's weakness that in Third Era 110, the High Elves almost fell to their historic foes in the War of the Isle. Were it not for the aid of the usually distant Sigic Order, conjuring a mighty magical maelstrom to thwart the seafaring elves, the Somerset Isles may well have fallen. In short, the Third Era was not kind to the High Elves. So when the Falmor party began to rise in popularity towards the end of the era, the political climate, combined with an ample helping of luck, precipitated the perfect storm. I'm sure you don't need me to point to any real-world examples when saying that a proud nation, when humiliated and downtrodden, is far more susceptible to the allure of radical ideas. And that is exactly what happened when the Falmor began espousing their extreme beliefs. They preached high elven supremacy over all other races, and the memory of Tiber Septim's brutal conquest had not been softened by the years. The Old Merry monarchy were not delivering, it was time for change. When the Oblivion Crisis struck, the Falmor capitalised. They exploited the confusion, claiming credit for the salvation of the Isles, despite the true cause of the invasion's end taking place hundreds of leagues away in the Imperial City. 
the fourth era saw the Falmor seize complete control of the province, promising expansion into Greater Tamriel. They overthrew the monarchy in the year 22, restoring the Somerset Isles to its traditional elven name of Alanor. Seven years later, Valenwood was brought into the fold, and the Third Aldmeri Dominion was officially reinstated. Elsewhere was more difficult to bring into the Dominion, but then came the Void Knights, which saw the moons disappear from the sky for two years between 4th era 98 to 100. As you can imagine, this disturbance was devastating to the Khajiit, whose lives are inextricably intertwined with Joan and Joad. The Falmor claimed credit for returning the moons, and soon later, the Catfolk were a part of the Old Merry Dominion. I could speculate on some theories regarding the Void Knights, like the potential of using the Shadow Dance Temple to reposition the moons, but that is not a discussion for today. Perhaps the Falmor took Massa and Secunda hostage to weaken the resolve of the Khajiit, or perhaps they simply took credit for a natural phenomenon when they returned of their own volition. Whatever the case, the Old Merry Dominion was reunited, and the Falmor set their sights on Greater Tamriel. The Great War would soon grip the land of Dawn's beauty. The Falmor wished to commence the conflict with a display of unyielding intent. On the 30th of Frostfall, 4th era 171, the Old Merry Dominion sent an ambassador to the Imperial City, with a gift in a covered cart and an ultimatum for the new Emperor. The long list of demands included staggering tributes, disbandment of the Blades, outlawing the worship of Talos, and ceding large sections of Hammerfell to the Dominion. Despite the warnings of his generals of the Empire's military weakness, Emperor Titus Mede II rejected the ultimatum. The Falmor had anticipated the Emperor's response. The terms of the ultimatum were meant to be unreasonable, and to accept them without a fight would wound Imperial pride. Ever a step ahead, the ambassador upended the cart, spilling over a hundred heads on the floor, every Blades agent in Somerset and Valenwood. Now, I won't dwell on the details of the war, or not for too long, but Dominion forces proceeded to advance into Cyrodiil and Hammerfell simultaneously. Lord Narafin's army struck for Cyrodiil's heart from the south, while Lady Aranelia's army crossed western Cyrodiil to strike at Hammerfell's flank. Meanwhile, Alanor's navy landed on Hammerfell's southern shores. It was a blitzkrieg, and like a sudden lightning storm, the Dominion overwhelmed the Redguard garrisons. The defenders were quickly overrun. Without shelter, they were vulnerable to the vicious strike of the Old Merry Storm. In a retreat that famously became known as the March of First, the Redguard defenders and the foreign Imperial legions were forced to retreat across the Alakir Desert to seek refuge in northern Hammerfell. It's possible that the assault on Cyrodiil was intended as a distraction to keep Imperial reinforcements from relieving the Red Guards, but whatever the case, Lord Narafin was baffled by the success of the advance, and in an effort to cut the head off the Ruby Snake, the Falmor leadership committed all available forces to claiming the seat of the Empire. The Imperial city was sacked, the Emperor was humiliated, and the White Tower was about to topple. The Imperial Palace was burned, the White Gold Tower itself was looted, and all manner of atrocities were carried out by the vengeful elves on the innocent populace. Had the war ended here, the Falmor secret plot may well have been carried out far sooner than anticipated. But the tides turned on the Dominion, and in the legendary Battle of the Red Ring, the united forces of Cyrodiil, Skyrim, and Hammerfell reclaimed the Imperial City. While a spirited band of veterans remained in Hammerfell to drive Lady Aranelia's forces back across the Alakir. In the end, the main Old Mary army in Cyrodiil was completely destroyed. The Emperor's decision to withdraw from the Imperial City in 4th era 174 was bloodily vindicated. Lord Narafin was kept alive for 33 days, hanging from the White Gold Tower. It is not recorded where his body was buried, if it was buried at all. One source claims he was carried off by a winged Daedra on the 34th day. Despite seemingly insurmountable odds, the pride of the Empire was restored. But the stark reality soon dampened the celebrations, for the Old Merry Dominion was capable of prolonging the war regardless of the defeat. The Emperor had no choice but to pursue diplomacy. Thus, the White Gold Concordat was signed. Legate Justianus Quintius gives his perspective in his account of the Great War. The terms were harsh, but Titus II believed that it was necessary to secure peace and give the Empire a chance to regain its strength. 
The two most controversial terms of the Concordat were the banning of the worship of Talos, and the cession of a large section of southern Hammerfell, most of what was already occupied by Old Merry forces. Critics have pointed out that the Concordat is almost identical to the ultimatum the Emperor rejected five years earlier. However, there is a great difference between agreeing to such terms under the mere threat of war, and agreeing to them at the end of a long and destructive war. No part of the Empire would have accepted these terms in 4th era 171, dictated by the Falmor at sword's point. Titus II would have faced civil war. By 4th era 175, most of the Empire welcomed peace at almost any price. The Red Guards, however, were emboldened by their victory. They had driven the Dominion back across the desert, and they knew the Elves would not want to traverse the arid expanse again for some time. Predictably then, Hammerfell spurned the terms of the Concordat, and refused to surrender an inch of their territory. The Emperor, in his desperate need for peace, had no choice but to officially renounce Hammerfell from the Empire. In the end, the heroic Red Guards fought the Old Merry Dominion to a standstill. Although the war lasted for five more years, and left southern Hammerfell devastated. The Red Guards and the High Elves eventually made their own accord in 4th era 180. The Second Treaty of Stross Mackay assured the withdrawal of all Aldmeri forces from Hammerfell. Quintius concludes, There can be no doubt that the current peace cannot last forever. The Falmor take the long view, as is proved by the sequence of events leading up to the Great War. All those who value freedom over tyranny can only hope that before it is too late, Hammerfell and the Empire will be reconciled and stand united against the Falmor threat. Otherwise, any hope to stem the tide of Falmor rule over all of Tamriel is dimmed. Now, while the Aldmeri Dominion have made no territorial gain since their capitulation to the Red Guards, they are in a very desirable position, manipulating Greater Tamriel's affairs from without. The Empire had soured their already precarious relationship with Morrowind during the Oblivion Crisis. The Imperial garrisons had all withdrawn when the Dunmen needed their support most. Combined with the disappearance of their demigod leaders six years prior, and Morrowind was ravaged by Dagon's Daedric invasion. As we know, Hammerfell was pushed out of the Empire, so that left only Skyrim and High Rock. But the terms of the White Gold Concordat would soon plunge Skyrim into disarray, as seditious Nords, led by Jarl Ulfric Stormcloak of Windhelm, felt that the Southron Imperials had no right to dictate who they could and could not worship. The Concordat outlawed Talos worship in the Empire, but the true sons and daughters of Skyrim fully intended to continue free worship. The Stormcloak Rebellion began, and the North was plagued by civil war. Now, you can see why the High Elves wish to depose Talos from his place among the Divines. Talos is Tiber Septim, well partially at least, as we may discuss in a future video. And in the eyes of the Myrrh, he was the tyrant who used a walking brass god to forcefully subdue them. For centuries they endured their human overlords, humiliated by leaders who cared not for their best interests. So, outlawing Talos worship was perfectly justifiable. But there was a secondary motivation for the Falmor, who were always quick to capitalise on the desires of the populace. The Ultima and the Nords have never seen eye to eye when it comes to spirituality. In fact, the Cyrodiilic Empire was founded on the principles of man and myrrh coexisting. Saint Alicia compromised on a lot in order to appease both sides of her cosmopolitan society. For example, the Nordic god of mankind, Shaw, was conveniently omitted from the Empire's new religion of the Eight Divines. I believe the Falmor exploited these religious differences to incite insurrection among the indomitable Northmen, who would not have their worship dictated to them by Elves. It was the perfect ruse. The Empire would have to enforce the Concordat, lest the war resume. A war they are severely unprepared for, and the Nords, who are incapable of capitulation, would rather predictably martyr themselves for their gods. Thus, the Falmor could watch as Cyrodiil went to war with its own vassal state. One of only two remaining vassal states, mind you. And that brings us up to speed. Without needing to predict the outcome of the Skyrim Civil War, we can comfortably make assumptions about what the Falmor would rationally do next. And this is where the Towers come into play. Altmeri culture is unique among the races of Tamriel. There is a fundamental distinction between elven belief and human belief. 
Generally speaking, the races of men are thankful to the gods, particularly sure in the case of the Nords, for allowing them to exist and to experience life, even if it is a finite life. Elves, on the other hand, they rue Lorcan for trapping them within the mortal realm. In the Merefic times, the Aldmer sailed from their doomed southern continent of Old Meris to settle the Somerset Isles. It has long been argued whether Old Meris ever truly existed, or whether it was a metaphor for the gradual decline of pure elven culture. The Pocket Guide states that, some say that Old Meris was sunk into the sea by the angry gods of the Aldmer. Others claim that the elven homeland has left Mundus, and will only return when the races of Mur are united as one. The guide also offers a description of Old Meris. Translations from the ancient tapestries and texts in the Crystal Tower of Somerset have yielded only the barest of sketches of a beautiful but very strange land. In no representation of Old Meris are there any trees or life but the Oldmer themselves. It appears always as an endless city, built upon itself over and over again, until no nature remains at all. Combine this information with the fact that not even the greatest Oldman naval navigators have been able to locate the Lost Lands, and I firmly believe that Old Meris is a concept, not a continent. The description of a lifeless city, built upon itself over and over again, sounds to me like the way ideas evolve in the mind. As the Oldman divide and take on new belief systems and ways to structure their society, the endless city is rebuilt, layer upon layer, in the mid to late Merefic era, there were multiple diasporas from Alanor to mainland Tamriel. Some, like the Dereni, were faithful to their old customs and beliefs. Others, like the Aelids, and especially the Kaima, diverged drastically. The sundering of Old Meris was the destruction of their unified culture and goals, not the physical destruction of their homeland. The Ultima pride themselves on maintaining the same value since the dawn of time or at least since the foundation of the Mundus, when they were trapped and devolved from godhood to mortality. They have an Anuic belief system, which means they align with Anu, who is Anuiel, who is Auriel, and not with Padamai, who is Siphis, who is Lorcan. The Padamaics thrive on limitation, and thus they are the antithesis of the Anuics. As Lorcan knew, this world contained more limitations than not, and was therefore hardly a thing of Anu at all. Mundus was the house of Siphis. As their aspects began to die off, many of the Atada vanished completely. Some escaped, like Magnus, and that is why there are no limitations to magic. Others, like Ifri, transformed themselves into the Elnafe, the Earth Bones, so that the whole world might not die. Some had to marry and make children just to last. Each generation was weaker than the last, and soon there were Aldmer. Darkness caved in, Lorcan made armies out of the weakest souls and named them men, and they brought Siphis into every quarter. When Auriel discovered the trickster's deception, he was tasked with resisting Lorcan and the men who followed him. Auriel pleaded with Anu to take them back, but he had already filled their places with something else. But his soul was gentler, and granted Auriel his bow and shield, so that he might save the Aldmer from the hordes of men. Some had already fallen, like the Kaima, who listened to tainted Atada. Therefore, the most pious of High Elves staunchly believe that any Elves who stray from Auriel's light are falling deeper into the Trickster's trap, and dooming the Elves to endure in their mortal coil. When the Falmor party first appeared in Somerset, during the first Old Mary Dominion, their role was to safeguard Altmeri heritage. Next, they oversaw the Dominion's efforts of expansion, and finally, when they reappeared again around the time of the Oblivion Crisis, they were more radical and more xenophobic and more expansionist than ever before. So, while the Falmor are hardly going to share their motivations with their enemies, they are clearly trying to conquer Tamriel. And I ask you now, is it based on a ravenous desire to spread the governance of the Dominion to every corner of a realm they despise? A realm ruled by a god they detest? Or is it based on the very real belief that the Towers of Creation are the pillars that hold up the sky, and keep the mortal realm of Mundus intact? It may be speculation to predict the motives of the Falmor, but the significance of the Towers is not speculation. The Falmor could easily capture Morrowind if they so desired, for the Dark Elves are weaker than ever in their illustrious history. Granted, it is a long way to sail, but the High Elves are renowned for their naval dominance. The High Elves see no value in seizing Morrowind, 
because its tower, Red Mountain, is already deactivated. If we look at a map of Tamriel, we can identify the towers that have either been deactivated or are in possession of the Old Mary Dominion. Of those that exist outside of the Dominion's territories and are still active, there are three. The first of these, the White Gold Tower, was occupied by the Falmor during the Great War and is no doubt still a target. It's actually possible that the White Gold Tower was deactivated when Martin Septim smashed the Amulet of Kings, although some believe that the statue of Akatosh took its place. The second, the Snowfroat, lies within a province that the Falmor are actively weakening and manipulating. The Falmor have the Empire wrapped around their finger, and Skyrim is in the process of destroying itself from within. That leaves only one target, the Ultimate Tower, Adamantia, was on Lady Aranelia's path during the war, and were it not for an inspired defense of Hammerfell's North by the veteran Red Guards, the Dominion would be on the shores of the Iliac by now. Cue the Elder Scrolls VI, which from what I've seen, is likely taking place in Hammerfell, and would you look at that, the coast is right there too. This brings us to the main questline of the Elder Scrolls VI, unraveling the mystery of Isle Balfiera. War is coming to the Iliac Bay, and the reclusive Dureni Elves must defend their tower from those who seek to destroy it. The Red Guards will oppose the High Elves, but they cannot succeed alone if the Dominion focuses all of their resources on retracing the March of First into the province's north. Hammerfell will need the support of the Empire, which includes a weakened Cyrodiil, Hyrock, and potentially Skyrim, but the latter is in question. If you've seen my video on why the Empire must win the Civil War though, then you'll know that it's possible the last Dragonborn could become the faceless Emperor of Cyrodiil, leading up to the events of the Elder Scrolls VI. Also, I plan to talk more about this soon, but if the Elder Scrolls VI is set in Hammerfell and the Iliac Bay, then it would be very convenient to have a storyline based around the return of the Ansei. Sword singing is a lost art, and who better to revive it than a prophesied hero? Mix all this together, and we have almost all the ingredients for the quintessential legendary hero deciding the fate of Tamriel storyline. I've given you the Falmor secret plot, which involves the deconstruction of all eight towers of creation, paramount among them being Adamantia. But if you're not quite sold on this being the main questline for the Elder Scrolls VI, then allow me to show you the final piece of the puzzle. There is a scholar named Beradalmo the Signifier, who seems to have some insider knowledge about certain towers of creation. In his text, Orbic Enigma IV, he details the story of the Bosma growing their tower of green sap. He also mentions Dureni Tower. He writes, the spike of Adamantia and its zero stone dictated the structure of reality in its orbic vicinity, defining for the Earthbones their story or nature within the unfolding of the dragon's time-bound tale. The Old Merry or Merefic Elves were singular of purpose, only so long as it took them to realize that other towers, with their own stones, could tell different stories, each following rules inscribed by Variorum architects. And so the Mer self-refracted, each to their own creation, the Kaima following Red Heart, the Bosma burgeoning Green Sap, the Ultima erecting crystal-like lore, Etalia. Beradalmo is suggesting here that the sundering of elven culture caused new towers of creation to spring into being, strengthening the legitimacy of Lorcan's mortal realm. In another of his texts, titled Once, the signifier speaks of the Dureni Elves. The second half of the story is most relevant to the topic, but I'm going to recite it in full, as this is one of the few texts that characterize the Dureni and give us a true sense of who they are and if they are to be the centerpiece of the Elder Scrolls VI, then they deserve to have their tale heard. This is a bittersweet ode celebrating the achievements and failures of the Dureni clan. Once we were great, once our battle reeves were masters of warfare, and our sapiarchs were wise and learned. Once we ruled all High Rock from the Elpheric Ocean to the mountains of Hrothgar, and the needs were our thralls and concubines. Once Dureni Cygnus, the Swan of Tyragul, discovered Balfiera and its tower, and claimed it for her own, decreeing that all of her clan who came after would bear her name. Once the art of alchemy was all but undefined, until Asliel Dureni compiled his compendious Almanac of Regents, and was invited to join the first Sigics on Arteum. Once, before Raven Dureni and her rules of Eldritch Binding, all enchanting was unique, and enchantments failed 19 times out of 20. 
Once, during the Elysian reforms, Ryan de Reni stood up to the entire empire. His Breton legions, armed and commanded by de Reni elves, controlled all the land as far east as Markarth and Elenir. The orc hold of Orsinium has been sacked many times, but we de Reni sacked it first. Once, at the Battle of Glenumbria Moors, Aidan de Reni's vastly outnumbered troops routed the entire Elysian horde, then chased them back to Cyrodiil. Once, before Corvus de Reni codified the rules of conjuration, every summoning of even a minor Daedra was an act to be feared and avoided. Once, Peregrine de Reni drove an entire Regarda flotilla back to Sentinel by merging her very will with the waves of the Iliac Bay. Once, in a single day, Peladil de Reni built Blackrose Prison from the scattered rubble of Lilmafeet ruins by summoning an army of stone Atronarchs. Yes, we were great once. But no matter what our individual achievements, every Dorenni since Cygnus has been eaten from within by failure, because we cannot solve the mystery of the Zero Stone, and use it to open the Argent Aperture which it wards. At maturity, every Dorenni of high blood is brought into the tower, conducted to the Foundation Vault, and shown the Zero Stone. We are allowed to touch it, once, so as to feel the transcendent mystical power that courses through it a power we have never been able to tap, and we are shown the Argent Aperture in the adjacent metallic wall, that door with its lock of thirteen slowly counter-rotating rings, a portal we have never been able to open, and we console ourselves that if we Dorenni have never been able to siphon the stone, or unlock the aperture, well then certainly, neither could anyone else. We return to the world above, and we do something spectacular, so we will not have to face our failure. But once, as our lives near their ends, each of us gathers together all our knowledge, the fruits of all our achievements, and once more makes that descent to the Foundation Vault, to try it, just once. Most are found within a day or two, dead and horribly distorted. Some, like my darling Heron, live on though terribly disfigured, too brain-blasted to understand what has happened to them. Me, I keep to our chambers in the Tourmaline Steeple, caring for Heron by day, and translating alien tomes in the library by night. And it's a good enough life too, though sometimes, when working on an ancient grimoire or Libris Magus, I question whether the arcane writings of our long-lost cousins are not better left a mystery. But then I think, is not all knowledge useful for something? And I think, what might this knowledge be useful for? And I think I might take that long walk downstairs, just once. I believe this text holds the most crucial information regarding the plot of the Elder Scrolls VI. I believe it will be the hero's responsibility to enter the tower, to descend into the Foundation Vault, and to be shown the Zero Stone. I believe the hero will feel the transcendent mystical power that courses through it, and I believe the hero will tap it. It will fall upon you to gaze upon the Argent Aperture, and unlock the thirteen slowly counter-rotating rings, opening a portal to a realm that has not been witnessed since the dawn, when the gods walked dawn's beauty. Will you be Tamriel's saviour, or its destroyer? And there you have it, the Falmor secret plot, and the main questline of the Elder Scrolls VI explained. I hope you enjoyed the video, thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to interact with me on Twitter or Discord, links can be found in the description, along with my Patreon please only consider pledging if you can afford to. Thanks again, my name's Drew the Daedrologist, you've been watching Drew Mora, and I'll see you in the next one.